uh, some of the bad stuff too, being the pest part of it. How many of you have dealt with alfalfa pests before? Probably the whole room, right? What have you guys dealt with? Weevil. Weevil. Okay. Anybody dealt with anything else? Aphids. Aphids. Okay. Was that after the weevils? Same time. Same time. <laughs> Double whammy. Anybody dealt with cutworms before? Couple people. Anything else? Random grasshoppers. I hate those things. Okay. So we've got a whole bunch of different pests, right? It's impossible for me to cover every single pest that we see in Montana in one presentation. It's not going to happen. So what I do is I, I do more of a, a broad general presentation. How do we deal with pests in alfalfa? I'm going to use alfalfa weevil as an example for the insect portion. And I also want to let you guys know, we know alfalfa weevil is a huge problem in Montana. So we're actually starting a project this year. We're going to start focusing mainly on the eastern part of the state. Um, but we're going to have agents in other parts in the central and western region as well. And we're going to be out there scouting. We want to start off with what is the weevil population? Where are we at? Okay? Because then what we want to do is we want to do some follow-up projects. We want to look at what's the best, me best method of control. How many spray? Okay? That's a pretty easy way to go about it, right? Dependable. We know what we can do. We know when we can do it. How many early harvest? A couple people. Okay. Also a dependable way. But what are you giving up when you're harvest early? Yield, right? How much money are we giving up, though? We don't know. Okay, so that's what some of these future projects are going to be looking at. The other cool thing that we're doing, has anybody ever heard of the orange wheat blossom midge? Okay, a couple people. It's a problem up in Kalispell. And we have this website through Montana State. It's called PestWeb, and it's a monitoring website. And so we're actually able to report what levels we're finding throughout the season. We're starting that with alfalfa weevil. So we have a bunch of different extension agents, Molly included, that's going to be out there scouting for us this year, and they're going to report, be reporting the numbers they find on these different fields. So we can actually be looking at an up-to-date interactive map where we can see, okay, where are the weevil populations occurring at the highest peaks that particular week or that particular couple of days? How is that changing throughout the season, and how can that help us with our control methods? Okay, And the control methods is what we're going to be talking about here. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about basic alfalfa management. They covered most of it, so we're going to kind of fly through that. But alfalfa management and proper alfalfa management is the number one way that we can protect ourselves against pests. Having a good, healthy alfalfa stand is going to help us a heck of a lot more than you know, relying just on chem uh, chemical application every single year. Okay? It really will. We're going to talk about the major insect pests. Again, I'm going to mainly focus on alfalfa weevil. And then I'm going to touch a little bit on weeds and alfalfa. Who has some weeds in their stand? I wish I didn't. I had to go out there and hand plot my alfalfa plots last year. Let me tell you, that was not fun. Um, how do we deal with weeds and alfalfa? What are some technologies that we have? And even with some of these technologies, what are some things that we need to be looking out for? So the big thing I'm going to talk about when we're talking about pest management is integrated pest management, IPM. Has anybody ever heard of that before? A couple people. What does it mean to you guys? More if you don't mind. More than one technique. More than one technique, absolutely. So not relying on just one thing. But we're going to be looking at a couple different tools that we can integrate together to try to control these populations. So EPA has kind of a long definition, as they always do, right? But the main thing effective and environmentally sensitive approach. So we're looking at all aspects of this. What happens or what are we seeing if we just apply chemical at the same time, the same chemical every single year? Resistance. Resistance, absolutely. What else? Does that pest population get better for the next year? Not usually, okay? What happens is that'll take care of that pest population this year, but what else is it doing? What else is it killing? the beneficials. And we're seeing this with the aphids. All right? A lot of times in the past, that beneficial population has been large enough that it's been able to keep that aphid population in, in check. But if we're killing off those beneficials, we have less predators out there to take care of those pest populations. So then the next year, we see that pest population higher and higher and higher. Again, that's what we're trying to get at with some of these projects. Okay, So we have to be really mindful about some of these tools that we have. They're effective. But what are some of the other um, aspects of it that we have to be looking out for? So with the IPM plan, we have typically four different parts. Number one, and this is so important, identify and monitor. 
How many of you are confident that they can identify an alfalfa weevil? I'm sure by this point you probably are, right? Um, Dr. Cecil Tharp, who is one of our pest specialists in, in Extension, he actually conducted a couple surveys last year and the year before, and he put up some different pictures of weevil larvae. And unfortunately, less than about 50% were actually able to identify it correctly. Okay? There are some larvae that look very similar to one another. So we, number one, have to be able to identify it correctly. We think it's a weevil. What if it's a beneficial and we're trying to kill it, right? That can have major implications on our production. So we want to identify. Then we want to monitor. Do you want to get out the sprayer at the first sign of a weevil larvae? Maybe not, right? Okay. I know that we do sometimes, right? It just happens. But we have these things called economic thresholds. I'm going to give you those numbers here today for weevils. We want to be getting that number. We want to be hitting that number when it's actually economically viable for us to be getting the spray tank out before we actually go out and start spraying. Those are those action thresholds. So we have to know what they are before we start. Talk about prevention. What can you do to prevent it for next year? A lot of times that's when we talk about early harvest, okay, and using that as a tool. And then, of course, we're going to talk a little bit more about the control. But the number one part of IPM, particularly in alfalfa, is always appropriate stand management. Danielle and Anish already covered a lot of that, so again, I'm not going to get into too much of it. Just a little bit, though. <laughs> On average, the lifespan of alfalfa is about five years. What do we think is the average lifespan of alfalfa in Montana? Seven? Any other guesses? Fifteen? Any others? Three. Three? Where are you at? <laughs> so the average lifespan of alfalfa in Montana is eight to ten years. Okay, the rest of the country is three to five years. I come from Pennsylvania. I did my PhD in Minnesota. Three to five years is the norm. The reason for that is we're getting somewhere between three, six, seven, even eight harvests a season. Are we getting eight harvests a season in Montana? No, unless we're cutting every other day maybe. Okay, we're getting one, maybe four in some areas if it's irrigated. Okay, so we handle our alfalfa a little bit differently. On average, though, we expect about 20 harvests out of the lifespan of that stand. Okay, that's a good number to kind of go by. So we're asking a little bit less from our alfalfa field each year than other places are. So we have that alfalfa stand in longer. That means we have to manage it a little bit differently. The older that alfalfa stand is, typically the more likely it is to have uh, pest infestation, disease infestation, and different things like that. So we really have to be on the lookout for it. Okay. When we harvest, usually, okay, we're not harvesting 20 days here in Montana. We're closer to that 40 to 45 day harvest interval if we're getting more than one harvest a year. But when we go through and harvest, that's going to drastically alter the microclimate within that field. We can use that to our advantage. Okay, we can use that to help control some of these pest populations. So again, I'm going to keep going through this really quickly. We want to maintain that vigorous stand. Rotate to other crops. This is really important especially if we have disease, especially if we have any sort of insect pests. We can rotate to a non-host crop for one, two, three years, and that can actually help to decrease that pest population, can hopefully decrease it for a long term, okay, before we start seeing those invade back into those fields. So why do we care about pests? Why is it a big deal? Of course, we have to go through all this. Main thing, we see that it can reduce quality up to 50% and yield up to 35%. We are losing a lot of our product. What part of the plant do alfalfa weevils feed on? The leaves. What part of the plant contains the protein, the energy, all those vi vital nutrients that we want to be feeding to our animals? The leaves, okay? So when that alfalfa weevil is feeding on that plant, it's removing the reason that we're growing that plant in the first place, okay? So it's having major implications on our profit. Aphids are another thing. Aphids have a major problem because they actually suck the nutrients out of that plant. So they can kill the plant because they're removing the moisture, they're removing that sugar, they're removing that starch. Okay? They're also removing all of those nutrients that we want to be giving to our animals as well. So we can see major um, decreases in that forage quality. And this is just a study that was looking at um, what the weevil was doing and how that was affecting overall forage quality. I realize you guys probably cannot read this, but just to kind of quickly go through it, when they were comparing a high weevil population that had been sprayed to a high weevil population that hadn't been sprayed, what they were finding 
is that this, the leaves were significantly decreased when they sprayed to not sprayed. So with those weevils there, they were losing a large portion of those leaves, okay? They were also losing a large portion of that crude protein, particularly showed up in that second harvest, where we were seeing about 0.7 tons of protein cut per hectare. That was cut in half when they didn't spray with those high weevils. Half of our protein is gone, okay? Again, major implications. So this just shows again how that, this is IV DMD, in vitro dry matter digestibility. So just digestibility. How does digestibility change with increase in larval, larval population? And as our larvae per stem increases, we see a drastic decrease starting at 78% digestibility without any larvae present. When we get down to about five larvae per stem, we're down to 72%. We're losing about 6% of our digestibility. That's a lot. Now this is not, a, this is a irregularity here, this little blip, it's not saying that we want four larvae per stem if we have to have any out there. I'm, they aren't exactly sure what was happening, okay? But you can see that if we were to take that out, it would still be a fairly linear decrease down here. And when we get down to this really high weevil population, we were down to about 70% digestibility, okay? Losing a significant amount. Same thing for the crude protein. In this particular study, it started off at 26%. When we get down to that five larvae per stem, they were under 23% protein. Again, just kind of reiterating, we're losing a lot of our value. So what, you, what about when you have issues? What can you do? Number one, like I said, identification. Know what you're dealing with. You have to know your pest in order to know how exactly you're going to combat it. Scouting is a really big thing. How many of you actually go out in your fields and scout? That's awesome. How do you guys scout? Do you use a sweep net? ball cap. I knew it. Okay, that was my second one. So we call it the ball cap method. We've actually labeled it now. I'm glad you're out there scouting. The biggest issue that we have with the ball cap. So have you guys seen a sweep net before? It looks like a butterfly net, right? Long and deep, okay? When you're going out there and you're scouting with that sweep net, it catches all of those larvae very easily. When you're out there with your ball cap, not as deep, right? What do you think is happening? You're losing some of them, okay? So you're actually underestimating what level you might be at. Maybe a cowboy hat might be a little bit better. It's a little bit deeper, okay? I recommend going to Molly and trying to grab a butterfly net or purchasing one for yourself. They're fairly cheap. We're actually, um, through part of this project, we're trying to get funding to supply you guys with butterfly nets and things like that so you can go out there and scout. But at least you're out there. That makes me really happy that you're out there counting, okay? That's the first part. And we're actually another part of the project. We want to validate the ball cap method. We want to see, all right, if you're out there with your ball cap, what's the threshold? We know it's going to be different than the butterfly net. So what number are we actually going for that's going to be an accurate indication? Again, that's going to be two or three years down the road, but we are working on developing that, so it's a little bit easier for you guys. But scouting is the number one thing that we want to be out there doing before we start thinking about should we spray, should we harvest early. Okay, and then when we talk about what we can do, we have four different parts when we're talking about an IPM plan. So if we see that we have the thresholds out there, how can we control it? Number one, the first thing that we want to look at is this biological control. Okay, so is there any natural enemies of these pests? We do have some for certain pests, okay? We have some parasitic wasps out there. Um, we have even fungal pathogens available in other states, okay? Our issue a lot of times, especially for fungal pathogens, they like warm, moist environments. Is Montana a warm, moist environment? No, okay? So we aren't gonna have the fungal pathogens available for weevil or cutworm or aphid control for a while. We have tried introducing some parasitic wasps. They work. A little bit. Sometimes we'll see about a 30% reduction, but we're not seeing as near of a reduction in populations as we are with some of our other methods like early harvest or even chemical control. Host plant resistance is another one. We do have some varieties that are aphid resistant. It does not mean that those aphids do not have the ability to go and start chewing off those alfalfa plant, the leaves. What it does mean is it has more terminal buds, so there's more leaf area there. So as a percentage, you'll see a lower or a smaller amount of destruction on those plants. Also, those varieties are bred to have faster regrowth. So when those buds are chewed on, the regrowth will actually initiate quicker. Issue with that, 
Most of these aren't winter hardy enough for our environment, so we're still limited there. So that means for weevil, we're down to these two. We're down to cultural control and chemical control. Okay, so cultural control is how do we manage that particular field to decrease those pest populations, and then chemical, of course, what chemicals do we have available? <clears throat> so like I said, we have a ton of different insects. I'm only going to focus on aphids, or excuse me, on weevils for the rest of this, um, just because I can't cover all of them, and I don't think you guys want to sit through me covering all of them today. So, pop quiz. Which one's a weevil larvae? Top one? Do we have agreement? Anybody say bottom? Don't look like Don't, well, well, I don't have a choice C, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're right, the top one. Why not the bottom? Blackhead. Blackhead, absolutely. So for the alfalfa weevil, these both have these plush green bodies, they have that white stripe, but this one has the black snout, okay? This one has a brown snout, that is not an alfalfa weevil. And it's been a while since I gave this presentation, I forget what that is actually, I apologize. But that is the alfalfa weevil, it has to have that black snout, okay? We have a really great service, the Scudder Diagnostic Lab, has anybody ever used that before? A couple people? If you have insects that you're not sure what they are, you can send them to them for free and they will identify them for you. Okay? So if you have any question, use them. If you have any sort of diseased plants, if you're afraid you have nutrient deficiencies, things like that, send them to Scudder for free and they will diagnose them for you. A lot of times with the nutrient deficiencies, they can't do that. They'll call me down if it's alfalfa or some other introduced species and we'll look at the symptoms and recommend going on from there. But if it's any sort of bacterial infection, they can diagnose that. Okay. If you have moldy hay, you can send them their moldy hay and they will tell you the species so that you can send it to a commercial lab and then they can actually analyze the count for you. So it's a really great service to use. Okay, For weevil, scouting, particularly for any insect species, you have to know your thresholds. You can be out there in the field and if you see you have four larvae per stem, what does that mean? Is that good or is it bad? That's why we have these thresholds. Okay. You don't necessarily want to get out your swather out. You don't want to get your spray tank out at that initial sighting. Look at these thresholds. So for the alfalfa weevil, it's an annual pest. This is what it looks like when that alfalfa weevil larvae has fed on that tissue, okay? It basically strips off all of that leaf tissue. So it's stripping off that protein, it's stripping off that energy. Both the larvae and the adults will feed on the plants, but the larvae is the most damaging and particularly in the third and fourth instar, so that third and fourth part of development of that larvae, that's where we're gonna see the most damage. When it gets to that point, a lot of times, the damage is already done, okay? We're already seeing leaves that look like that, so we wanna be out there scouting before then. I'll show you how to do that. When temperatures in the spring get above 48 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when those adults are going to emerge. That's when they're going to start laying eggs. That's when we want to start being out there in our fields looking for those larvae to emerge. So this is the life cycle. This is what an adult looks like. It's a snout-nosed beetle. It has a brown and black mottled body and it has seven legs. So remember, it emerges when spring temperatures reach 48 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll then come out. It'll start laying eggs in the stems of those alfalfa. It can lay in its lifetime anywhere from 400 to 1,000 eggs, one single adult, okay? Highly proliferative, okay? This is why we see such increases in population so quickly. The egg will stay in, in the egg form, excuse me, for about one to two weeks. Then it's gonna emerge as a larvae, okay? And this will be about two to three weeks. It's so critical that you get out there and you start scouting right when those larvae start emerging. And you're not going to see that initial damage when those larvae start feeding because a lot of times they're feeding on the folded leaves of those, that growing alfalfa. Okay? So when you're out there scouting, you really have to get down into those leaves, look at those folded up leaves to be looking for those larvae. Okay? It'll stay in the larval form for about two to three weeks. Then it's going to spin a cocoon at typically the base of those alfalfa plants and that'll last for about one to two weeks. It'll reemerge then typically about middle to end of summer as that adult. The adults go into what's called a diapause. They're in the field, but they're not really doing a whole lot. That's not a good time to be out there scouting. You want to be out there scouting right when it's just emerging as that larvae. 
And adults, they can move fairly far, okay? They can move up to a couple miles, depending on wind and things like that. So weevil control really needs to be a community effort. Because if you're controlling your weevils, but your neighbor's not, guess what? You're probably gonna have weevils next year too, okay? So this is really when you start, need to start talking. They've documented adults traveling over 10 miles. Okay, that's a really far distance for such a small little insect. Okay, so again, just showing you some more up close pictures. You can really see, oops, that mottled body right there. And of course they have the antennae as well and it does have a snout. So to scout, there's a couple different methods. There's, of course, the, the uh, sweep net method or the ball cap method, which I'll talk about next. But the really accurate method is what we call the stem method or the stem count method. And what that means is just like if you were taking a soil test or a tissue test in your field, you'd walk randomly throughout your field and you're going to cut about 30 stems at each site okay, and cut them off at stem base. Then you're going to take the stems and use a white bucket. That's going to make it the easiest to kind of spot and count these larvae. But you just take those stems and you invert them in your bucket and you shake them off really hard. You want to look at those folded leaves again, make sure you get all that larvae out there. And what you're going to do is you're going to count the number of larvae you collect, you're going to divide it by the number of stems you cut, and that's going to tell you your weevil density or larvae per stem. Okay? Then you're going to use these thresholds that we set. Another good piece of information to have is plant height. Okay, that's going to help you to get really accurate when you're talking about your thresholds and when you need to be out there spraying. So this is a chart <clears throat> that uses a whole bunch of different information. It can get kind of complicated. And if you guys want any of this information or anything Danielle or Anish presented, please feel free to contact myself or Molly and we can get this to you. But what this economic threshold is based on is number one, crop value. So how much do you expect to get per ton? How much do you estimate it to cost to treat? And what maturity your alfalfa is at or what height it's at? So if we're estimating we're going to get about $125 per ton. We estimate it's going to cost $7 per acre to treat. And we're at early bud stage. We need to see only 1.6 larvae per stem before we want to go out there and cut or before we want to go out there and spray. It's kind of complicated, right? A lot of information needed. You need to email me or Molly. You need to call people to do this. That's usually why the ball cap method is used or the stem count. I'm going to get by that. Or the sweep net. This is very easy to use. It's highly effective. But I really do recommend using a sweep net. It's going to give you a better number, I promise, until we validate the ball cap method. But with the sweep net method, what you want to do is you want to go to 20 different spots throughout your field. Again, randomly throughout your field. And you'll take your sweep net. You'll put it right at canopy height. And you want to go 20 times back and forth, 180 degrees. And you want to make sure it's 180 degrees to make sure this is as accurate as possible. Okay? You want to go through your field several different times. There are several different locations. You're just going to count how many larvae you get, divide that by how many sweeps you did. When you are at more than 20 larvae per 180 degrees sweep, then you treat. It's a little bit easier than knowing the value of your hay, knowing your treatment costs, the height and all that stuff, right? A little bit easier to use. Any questions so far on scouting or the weevil in general? Okay, so when we talk about management, number one, I can't recommend this enough, early harvesting is a really great way to control these populations because you're removing that habitat. So you're killing the larvae that are in there, preventing them from repopulating, okay? You're removing any sort of food source, you're removing the canopy cover. Larvae are very sensitive to light. If they have a lot of sunlight on them, that will kill them. They'll actually dry out. That's why early harvesting works. But the big thing is, you have to make sure that you pick up those swaths quickly enough if you do use early harvesting, so that the larvae don't just migrate under those windrows and start eating on the regrowth. Question? Those eggs that, that, uh, that the male lays, where, do they, where, where are they? Inside the, the, the stem? Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you were to, to cut open, like cut it in half an alfalfa stem, yeah. they will actually be inside that stem. So you can see them. Yes. And I, I apologize. I usually have a picture in there. I think I removed it to condense this talk. Um, yeah, you can actually see the eggs within the stem. They're very small, like very, very small. So you might want to get like a hand lens out there, but you can actually see them. Yep. Yep, and they're usually yellow um, to like a yellow muddy brown in color. Um, so you get a pretty good idea of how 
big an infestation you would have if, if you know if you could Eggs aren't going to be the best way because you're also going to be damaging your alfalfa plants by cutting them open, right? The, um, when it gets to that first initial larvae, that's when it's the best time to get out there. And I think I still left, I hope I still left um, the timing in there. If not, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when to get out there. Um, but yeah, the larvae is going to be the best time to get that idea. Yep. So with that, you want to make sure this is a picture of uh, a field that the swaths weren't, wasn't picked up quickly enough. And you can see right here, that frosted appearance, that's where those larvae actually start eating on that regrowth. You'll notice the damage within 10 days. We're lucky here in Montana that it doesn't take a lot of time between swathing to baling. Where I'm from in Pennsylvania, sometimes it can take 10, 12 days in order to bale up a product because it's just so humid. So we do see this a lot of times. But you want to pick that up as quickly as possible. Okay, removing that habitat, exposing those larvae to that sunlight. We don't really have resistant varieties. There are three, um, Perry Arc and Weevil Check are three that have been tested in Montana. Um, I haven't seen consistent results of it actually surviving, so I'm, it's not safe for me to recommend that just yet. I think we need hardier varieties to actually be able to work here in Montana. We don't have the biological control yet either. Again, our environment just isn't working with us, unfortunately. But we do have chemical control. The one thing with chemicals, they're labeled for either adult or larvae. The ones that are labeled for larvae and when you target the larval stage are going to be more effective. If you can imagine, the adults can move around a little bit, right? So when you're spraying that field, you don't necessarily know that you're getting those adults. The larvae can't move around a lot. They're gonna be on basically one plant and that's where they're gonna hang out. So if you're spraying something that's targeting that larval stage, it's going to most likely hit those larvae. It's going to most likely kill them. The thing you want to be mindful of though, again, is those beneficials. And what you can do to decrease your impact on the beneficials is spray either really early in the day or really late in the day. That's when they're the least active. So you're going to be missing a large portion of them, hopefully, if you're hitting those two time points. Okay. Okay. Another option that has been looked at in Montana, another cultural option, is grazing. And this was a study that was done at MSU where they were using sheep grazing. And what they did is they placed sheep in these fields in late winter and allowed them to graze after the alfalfa had started growing. Now they evaluated the alfalfa. They wanted to see if they injured the alfalfa in any way. They did not. They did not see any significant differences in yield by the second harvest. But what they did see was significant decreases in weevil population. So these lines right here, the one, this top line with the open circles, those are the non-grazed plots. And this was the graze plots, and this is year one and year two of the study. And what we can see is, look here, look how much of a difference we're seeing between the grazed and ungrazed plots. That's a significant reduction in weevil population just by grazing. And they did that early in the year, okay, so that their harvest was delayed a little bit, but they were seeing that significant reduction. They did not have to get the, the sprayer out there. They didn't have to worry about early harvesting. They didn't have those negative impacts of that weevil population because they took care of it early. And basically what, they, what was happening is number one, if the adults were um, overwintering in the field, the sheep were actually stepping on them, killing them that way. But because they left the sheep on a little bit later, after it was above the 48 degrees temperature, those weevils had already started laying their eggs in the stems of the plants. And so the um, sheep were actually eating off those stems, eating those eggs so they weren't ever able to get to the larval stage. So this could be something that actually may work in Montana. Okay, this was just looking at, you know, what were the impacts on plants? They were looking at stem height again, year one, year two. No differences between the grazed and ungrazed in stem height. So that alfalfa, even after it was grazed, was able to have that compensatory growth. It was able to catch up. They didn't see any negative impacts on their overall production. So again, a really viable option that we could be looking at. And then I have this, again, if you, if you want um, any of this information, feel free to email me. This is a list of all, of, or not all, but most of the different uh, insecticides that are available for alfalfa weevil, that are registered for alfalfa weevil. Gives you the ingredient, the class, um, the rate per acre, as well as the pre-harvest and pre-grazing intervals. And those are really important to follow. You wanna make sure you read the label every time. If you want this information, please feel free to email me. We have quite a few that are registered for use. Okay, and you can use this for, use the same process. Use the scouting. 
Use the identification. Use the thresholds for other insects as well. I included aphids in here, okay? Same thing. We want to know the height. We want to know what sort of aphid we're dealing with. And then we can decide what is our threshold. So a lot of times we see the pea aphid here in Montana. All right? If our alfalfa is 20 inches, we need to see at least 100 pea aphids per stem before we would want to treat. Okay? Now, if you're walking through your field and you come out and you're completely covered in aphids, you're probably at that threshold, I would guess. Okay? But knowing these numbers is really good. Cutworms. I heard a couple people had cutworm issues, right? Number one, we do have two different type of cutworms here in Montana. Okay, we have the, uh, the pale western and the army cutworm. But they have the same threshold. It's just different in how we find them. The pale western is going to be a subterranean cutworm. It's going to completely live under the soil surface. So it's going to be really difficult to find them. You're probably going to notice the damage first until, before you see those cutworms. The army cutworm will go above the soil surface at night. So you might want to call your neighbors before you go out there in the middle of your field at the night. But going out there at night with a flashlight is probably the best time to find them. Okay, They're coming about above that soil surface. The light, again, will dry them out. That's why they're trying to avoid that sunlight. Okay, But for those, what we're looking for in a mature stand, three to four larvae per foot. Or in a new seeded stand, two larvae per foot. Those are our thresholds before we would treat. Okay. All right, any questions on insects before I just briefly get into weeds? Yeah? We're starting to see a lot more aphids in our area. Mm -hmm. Because we're spraying for weevil and, you know, more than we used to, is that... Do you want the honest answer? Probably. Um, we have a lot of really great um, beneficials that usually are able to keep that aphid population in check. So, and so basically it was weevil that kept the aphid population at a, at a dull roar? Is it no, no, no. Um, so the weevils aren't necessarily parasitizing the aphids. We have parasitic wasps. We have, um, shoot, damselflies, ladybugs, all of those types. There's a bunch of different species that will decrease that aphid population. But when we go out there and spray with those chemicals, we're killing off those beneficials. That's allowing room for those aphids to proliferate and increase. And that's, I think, part of the reason why we're seeing that. Yep. Any other questions yet? How did they keep from bloating the sheep? Um, luckily, so when they were grazing the alfalfa, it was fairly short. So I think they also had another hay source out there. And that was helping to decrease the risk of bloat. I wouldn't do this with cattle. Uh, I think cattle are probably going to bloat a little bit easier than sheep would, but they did not see any <coughs> incidence of bloat on there, and they did have a grass hay out. And you didn't treat them with any... They didn't in this particular study. I, again, I would not recommend that. Um, I would probably put out some sort of bloat block um, just to kind of make sure that you're avoiding that at all costs. But they, they didn't do that, and again, they didn't see it. I still wouldn't recommend it. I would want to safeguard my animals if all possible. Did the study mention the stocking density? Of the I don't have that. Um, I think they did mention it in there, but I just don't have it off the top of my head. I do know that they grazed it down pretty hard. I mean, it, it was about two to three inches off the ground before they took them off. And they did that it fairly, they were rotating the sheep around, so they weren't continuously grazing on that alfalfa, um, but they were able to mm -hmm. kind of get them back to those pastures as it was growing to prevent those insect eggs, or excuse me, the eggs from going to larvae. But I can get that information, too, if you're interested. OK, so just kind of briefly going through weeds, because again, just like the insects, there's so many different weeds in alfalfa. The, the best thing you can hope for if you have alfalfa is to have grass weed infestation. How often does that happen? We usually have broadleaf, right? Um, so we're a little bit more limited when we have a broadleaf weed in our alfalfa versus a grassy weed. If we have a grassy weed, we can use selective herbicides to target those grasses, decrease um, their production. The issue that we have, no matter what type of weed, is that it competes directly with al our alfalfa. So basically, it's a vicious cycle. If those weeds get a spot, get into that field at all, they're going to start competing with that alfalfa. They're going to decrease the productivity of that alfalfa, allow more room for more weeds to, to come in and invade. So if you start seeing a weed invasion, you want to get on top of it right away. The other thing is you want to identify why do you have that weed invasion in the first place. Is your stand declining? Is there a presence of disease? You might want to go out and dig up a couple plants. Okay, Is your stand really old and it's just maybe time to be thinking about renovation? So you want to get out there and first identify before you start spending a lot of money in trying to take care of these weeds why they're there in the first place. And then that healthy alfalfa, so fertilizing is really going to be the best way to compete. 
and, and Anish did a really great job of talking about this, you really want to be looking at nutrients. Potassium, uh, phosphorus, sulfur, boron, those are all so important when we talk about alfalfa production. And if those are limiting, you're going to significantly decrease the alfalfa productivity, decrease its ability to compete with those weeds. Okay. One of the, the really good tools that we have is Roundup Ready Alfalfa. Does anybody use that here? A couple people? Do you like it? Okay. Roundup Ready is a great tool to have. It's a tool that we want to keep for a long time. So even though we have this awesome, awesome Roundup resistant plant, we still want to be looking at other methods of weed control as well because we want to make sure that we still have this in our toolbox 10 years down the road. Okay. So having it, especially if you have a weedy issue, it's a great way to start dealing with that. But also looking at other things as well. And one thing that I wanted to point out with the Roundup Ready alfalfa, they're actually finding that timing of application of Roundup can still injure the Roundup Ready alfalfa. They started discovering this in California and it was a new thing and they couldn't quite figure out what was going on. So in 2014, Dr. Steve Orloff was called out to producer's field. And the producer took him out and it was wheel line irrigated and he had just sprayed early in that spring and basically what he found was that everywhere where that wheel, wheel line sat, the alfalfa looked just fine. But everywhere that wheel line wasn't, the alfalfa was stunted and a little bit yellowed. And it almost looked like it had been winter killed. But that doesn't make sense because there were plants in that same field right next to it that hadn't been winter killed. So they were trying to look and see. They thought it was frost damage. They were trying to do testing, nutrient deficiencies, things like that. They weren't exactly sure what was going on. And it wasn't just this field. He started looking around. He started seeing it in other fields. So then he started putting out test plots, and he wanted to see if he could replicate this damage. And they theorized that it might have been the Roundup <laughs> that had caused this. So he set up trials in a couple different locations. He had a bunch of different rates, all the way up to 44 ounces per acre, and he couldn't get consistent results. Some fields he was seeing the damage, some fields he wasn't. So then he started looking back at the records and looking at, okay, what was going on with the weather? Was there any correlation here? And basically what he found was that if that glyphosate was applied within a couple days or even up to two weeks before a frost, he saw major damage on his alfalfa. Okay? And so that's something we really need to be looking at. They were seeing up to a 0.8 ton per acre reduction in that first harvest. That's nothing to sneeze at. Now by the second harvest, the damage was gone. It wasn't visible. It uh, grew just fine. But that first harvest, 0.8 tons per acre, that would mean a lot of money, right? Not something we want to be dealing with. And this is kind of what you see. So it forms kind of the shepherd's hook initially, where that top part of that plant starts to droop. Again, this can look like other damage. It can look like frost damage a little bit even. But what you'll notice then is after a couple days, it'll actually start yellowing, and that part of the plant will kind of die off a little bit, okay? It'll make up from the crown buds. It will, the regrowth will come back on that plant. It won't kill the plant, but it may kill those individual stems. And when we're looking at different fields, okay, this is an untreated field, so they didn't spray it with glyphosate in the spring. This was a field where they did. And you'll see a lot of yellowing, okay, you can see even some bare ground in there, because it was killing off some of those stems. This can even look like some nitrogen deficiencies. So it was at first really hard to diagnose. And he's theorizing that we might have actually been misdiagnosing a lot of fields as a nitrogen deficiency or as winter injury or frost injury that may have in fact been injury from that roundup. Okay, so it's something that you want to be thinking about when you're out there spraying. If you're spraying in the spring, especially if you still have some expectation of frost, you want to make sure that your alfalfa is less than two inches tall. Okay, if it's less than two inches tall, typically we do not see that injury occurring whatsoever. The other benefit is when the alfalfa is that small, typically you're going to have better control on your weeds because your weeds are smaller too. Okay, so you're going to have better kill on your weeds. You're not going to be injuring your alfalfa. So really try to target it when that's two inches, less than two inches tall. They're actually rewriting the label on this to reflect this research. It previously wasn't on there because they didn't know it existed. Now the label is saying that as well. Okay? And if alfalfa is greater than two inches and frost occurs within days or weeks, that's typically when you're going to see injury. Okay? So remember, spray when it's less than two inches in the spring if you have any risk of frost occurring. Okay. So again, just kind of wrapping up, chemical control again is the most common. Okay. It's reliable. We kind of know what to expect. But the one thing I wanted to uh, make sure to emphasize is if you are relying on chemical control, number one, 
always read labels. And number two, consider rotating between herbicide classes. We want to avoid having that herbicide resistance. We already have four weeds that are resistant in Montana. And by rotating between herbicide classes, that's going to decrease that resistance, that development of resistance um, much longer. It's going to take much longer um, if it happens at all. I have these as well if anybody is interested. Again, feel free to email me. This is a really nice tool. It was developed by Ohio State. Um, and I have a couple different manuals as well. Basically, it lists the common broadleaf and grassy weeds that we see in alfalfa, as well as different herbicides and their effectiveness on each of these different weeds. So a rating of zero means no control. A rating of nine means full control. So if you guys are interested in this, please feel free to email myself or Molly, and we will get these to you. And then the last part of cultural control is number one, harvesting before seed set. Okay, make sure that we're not introducing new seeds into that soil that are gonna then sit in that soil until it gets a chance to grow. Okay, so I have I worked with or talked to a producer in Plevna, and he had a big infestation of cheatgrass. And what he did for three years is he just harvested off that cheatgrass before it set seed. He didn't spray a single chemical on it, he just relied on that harvesting, that early harvesting of it. And within three years, he said that he did not have any more cheatgrass in that field because there were no more seeds put in that soil bank. Now, cheatgrass is a little bit easier than some other weeds because typically, on average, cheatgrass seeds can only last about three to five years in that soil. We have some seeds that can last over 50 years. So I don't think we're going to be harvesting early for 50 years, right? But for something like cheatgrass, that's definitely a tool that we can use. And regardless of the weed, we always want to prevent the reintroduction of new seeds into that weed soil bank. Okay. And then I didn't really want to talk about disease a whole lot, um, just for time. But obviously disease is another issue. Danielle addressed that a little bit and how we can scout for disease. The big thing is if we do have disease, you want to rotate to a non-host plant. And there are some things, some annual legumes, say peas, that are actually host to some of these same diseases that alfalfa is. Okay, so really you want to be looking at, okay, maybe rotating to a cereal forage, such as wheat or barley, that isn't going to be host to most of these diseases to help clean up those, those different um, bacterial and fungal pathogens that we see out there. Again, knowing what you're dealing with is important. Sometimes you only need to rotate out for two years to clear it up. Some diseases can actually last in the soil up to eight years. So again, having a good idea of what you're dealing with is really going to help you in addressing that. Um, just one example. This was a client that I had up in the Great Falls area. She had uh, what was diagnosed as sclerotinia in her sanfoin. And sanfoin is very similar to alfalfa. There was no weeds, but there was lots of grass and a declining sanfoin. She asked, what should she do? Okay. Number one, I wanted to start off with what I wouldn't do. Number one, I didn't want to rotate to a host crop such as alfalfa. Alfalfa and sclerotinia, both perennial legumes, both host to sclerotinia. Peas also host to sclerotinia. So that's when you want to be talking about rotating off to some other cereal. Okay, soybeans, sunflowers, those also can be hosts, avoiding all of those different species. What you should do if you have a disease present, number one, send it to Scudder so we can diagnose it, right? And then look at keeping maybe even a perennial grass in that field for several years. Really try to clean that up so that you don't have to be spraying any fungicides. Okay, that costs money. So does planting, but at least you're getting something out of it right away. And then also understanding the etiology and pathology of the disease. Some of them, if you just reduce canopy cover, that's enough to help to decrease the overall impact of that bacteria, that fungus, on your stand. Irrigation is also really important. Do we have much irrigation over here? Okay, a couple people, okay. So if you have any disease present, introducing water, particularly with fungal pathogens, that's going to increase their life cycle. It's going to speed up um, how quickly they can invade in certain situations. So knowing that, again, knowing your disease is really going to help. And then also keeping records, all right? If you're on average getting three tons per acre, and all of a sudden you're getting 2.5 tons, it doesn't maybe not sound like bad production, but that's a half a ton per acre loss. It's probably something that was happening there. If it wasn't the weather, if it wasn't because, you know, we didn't get hardly any rain in June, it might be something else. And having those records is really going to help you keep track of that. And I really, really do recommend doing this. No matter what you have, if you have a perennial foraging, dig up some plants. Those roots can tell a lot. 
All right, so dig up the plants, whether it's alfalfa, whether it's sandpoint, um, whether it's orchard grass or timothy. Particularly with those leg legumes, dig them up and split them open. See what the inside of that root looks like. If it's off color, that means there's presence of disease. You can send that to us and we'll diagnose it for you. Okay, and this is just some pictures. This is again a field that I got that was actually again out of Great Falls. So these are some plants that were dug up. What do we think about them? Can you guys see it very well at all? Anyways, anybody have an opinion? You just want me to tell you what I think? Yeah, okay. So these plants look fairly healthy. Okay, we see a little bit of a lesion forming here. We see a little bit of that crown rot starting to form up here. But overall, this would probably score about a one on that rating scale that Danielle was talking about. We would not want to do anything with this stand unless for some reason the production was decreased significantly for some other reason. These look pretty darn healthy. Okay, what about these? Yeah, we're seeing a little bit more discoloration, right? Okay, so we see that, oops, farther down that root, a little bit deeper, we're seeing that kind of quirkiness starting to develop. It's really dark brown there. We see lesions over here that are fairly large, starting to take up more of that root mass. And also with this plant, you can't see it very well, but it was very asymmetrical, okay? And this picture doesn't depict it very well. Asymmetry is a really good indicator of an unhealthy plant. So if you have stems only coming off of 50% or say 70% of that crown, that means that that plant is likely infected. That's probably a good one to dig up as well and just see what's going on. But asymmetry is a good way from above the ground to look at that overall plant health. And what about this? It's pretty bad, right? Okay, we don't have very many stems coming off of it. This means that plant's basically dead. Okay, if you see plants that look like this or this, that probably means it's, you have a significant disease present. You need to renovate out and rotate to a non-host crop. But first, I would want to know what it is exactly that's infecting your plants. So I went through a lot of things in a very short period of time. I was hoping to leave some time for questions if you guys have any um, regarding alfalfa, regarding anything forage related. So. Do you guys have anything for me? If you work your fields in the spring, does it more diseases set into them? Working your fields in the spring? Not necessarily, um, unless for some reason you were introducing something that had a, a fungal pathogen on it. Shouldn't be any different. Nope. Yeah? Do aphids do the same damage to a, to a uh, crop or plant as a weevil do? No. So weevil are just going to eat the actual leaf tissue. Aphids will actually, they have um, kind of like a it's a snout that they actually stick in, inside the alfalfa plant and they will suck out the nutrients from that plant. So you'll see a lot of wilting occurring from that. So it can actually kill the plant from that because it's taking away its vital nutrients that the plant needs to live. Um, with weevils, you know, removing that leaf tissue, the plant can still survive. Uh, aphids can do a little bit more damage than that. Yep. But they basically lay the eggs in the same way as the Their life cycle is a little bit different. Um, the timing's a little bit different. A lot of times we see aphids coming on a little bit later than those weevils, um, so it's a little bit more delayed, but it's kind of similar to this. Um, they do spend most of their life cycle in that alfalfa field, yes. Maybe I didn't need to leave so much time, huh? Does mechanical uh, tillage in the spring help kill the adult weevils? You know? That's a great question. Um, a lot of people have asked me that. We don't have great information on that. Theoretically, it should help a little bit um, because some of those adults do overwinter in the alfalfa field. But the problem is that a lot of the adults don't overwinter in the alfalfa. So if you're hitting it too early, you're not getting a large percentage of them. Um, if you're hitting it when the uh, weevils have already laid eggs in the stems, you can actually damage your alfalfa plants then. So it's really a fine line to walk. You know, if, you're, if they're already starting to grow, you might do more harm than good by working that alfalfa field if that alfalfa plant is actively growing. Um, if it's before it's actively growing, you're probably not hitting a large portion of them. They can overwinter in other fields. They don't necessarily need to overwinter in the alfalfa. They can go to a different crop completely and hang out there. So. Oh, you can go to your neighbor's alfalfa field. You know, it, they can go, like I said, up to 10 miles. Yeah, those darn little buggers are good at surviving. Anything else you guys got for me? So if you're out in like 
in, in the hills, you have native grass and stuff. They can go out there and there too. Native grasses, I don't think, are going to be as great of a host just because it doesn't have as much cover as, say, um, a, an introduced pasture or something or, you know, like some good wheat stubble. That's fairly consistent. You know, with the native, you're kind of more patchier. They theoretically can, and I'm pretty sure I've talked to um, our extension entomologist, and he has said that they can overwinter in other species, such as a native, but I don't think it's as gonna, gonna be as good of cover as other species that we might have available. So I got pivots and there's grass around them. So it's grass under pivots? No. Oh, okay, outside. I don't think it's gonna be as good of a host. As they're probably gonna be more concentrated in those pivots. Is Roundup Ready a alfalfa as susceptible to weevil as a conventional alfalfa is it almost the same? There's going to be no difference unless it's a, a variety that was specifically bred for that increased branching. It's not going to be any different. No. Is that all they do for the resistance? Is faster growth and more... That's all we have for now. Um, we don't have anything resistant to cutworms because cutworms, you know, cut the plant. How can you resist that? We don't have anything really resistant to aphids either because, again, they're sucking the life juice, if you will, out of that plant. So with weevils, that's the best way that we can combat that. So by saying it's e alfalfa weevil resistant is not necessarily true marketing. It's just less susceptible to overall damage. But I don't think that makes a great marketing tool. Yeah. Do you have any studies on foliar fertilizing? Foliar versus granular? Uh, I don't personally. They have done that before. Um, if I can remember correctly, because it's been a while since I've looked at them. Um, they weren't seeing major differences. They were... It depends on what you're fertilizing with. Like I said, nitrogen is typically going to be more volatile as a liquid form, and so they were seeing decreases in overall effectiveness with the liquid nitrogen. But with phosphorus and even potassium, I don't think they were seeing major differences. The sulfur research that they did, I was telling um, one person, so in moccasin, they were applying all different types of sulfur fertilizer, and they had liquid, they had granular. The liquid actually, I think, worked the best. And when they were doing these tests, they had it set up so that they were applying nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. When they removed that sulfur, they were getting the same production, so pounds per acre, as they were in the plots that had no fertilizer applied at all. So even when they were applying nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, if it didn't have any sulfur applied, they weren't getting any increase in yield over the no fertilized plots. Sulfur is really important, and they were only applying about eight pounds per acre of sulfur. So it doesn't take a whole lot to see a major benefit, and they were almost doubling their yield by applying the adequate amount of sulfur. So, but I, yeah, I can't think. I'm sorry, off the top of my head about that. that. Sprayer applied or pivot applied? Or? Um, sprayer, sprayer. Yep. Yeah, um, they're starting to do more and more work with kind of the chem irrigation, uh, the fertility irrigation like that, and. They're having really great success, particularly because we know that every time you drive a piece of equipment over your alfalfa field, you can decrease your yield by 6% per time you go over that alfalfa field. And so I think a lot of times when we're seeing increases in yield from fertigation, not necessarily just from that irrigation, but also because we're decreasing how many times we drive. So, any other questions? I think I have... Oh, here's some additional resources, but you can always email me for that. And there's my contact information if you ever want to give me a call or shoot me an email. So thank you all for your time. <laughs>